Good afternoon. I would like to thank the administrators of this conference on ALS for inviting me to present the Deanna Protocol. My 30-year-old daughter Deanna began experiencing neurological symptoms in late 2007. She had the usual examinations and tests to rule out various disease conditions. She was ultimately diagnosed in 2009 with the classical form of ALS with both upper and motor, lower motor neuron disease along with boba symptoms. As we know, there were no adequate treatments and no cure for this disease, and the prognosis was devastating. I am a retired orthopedic surgeon, and I was not willing to accept the prognosis for this disease offered by mainstream neurologists. I decided to do my own research. What I learned was that there are three facts that almost all neurologists agree on in relation to ALS in specific and neurodegenerative diseases in general. One, nerve cells lack energy. Two, nerve cells die. Three, glutamate accumulates. The majority of research on ALS is focused on cell debris and search for a magical substance which, which will cure ALS. Each new finding raises more questions than it answers. Multi-center coordinated research costing millions of dollars was done to find compounds or substances that could break down glutamate. This concentration of research to find something to break down glutamate led us to study the normal metabolism of glutamate. At first, we looked at the enzymes that break down glutamate. Two enzymes in particular interested us. One was GDH, glutamic acid dehydrogenase, which breaks down glutamate to AKG, alpha-ketoglutaric acid, and the other, GAD, glutamic acid decarboxylase, which breaks down glutamate to gamma-aminobutyric acid. We were not able to find either of these enzymes available, nor were we able to have them compounded. Even if one feels that the pathology is due to defective transportation of glutamate out of the clefts, we think lowering the quantity of glutamate in the body is still a valid approach. We also think that the genes that produce these enzymes, the GLUT2 for GDH, the GAD1 for GAD, are worthy of investigation. Corruption of these genes could be where the disease starts. Recent studies at the University of Miami have concentrated on the corruption of genes as a possible cause of ALS and neurodegenerative diseases. The investigation is ongoing. Now they need to investigate corrupted enzymes derived from these genes. We hypothesize that the corruption of the enzyme GDH causes the accumulation of glutamate and hence the lack of its breakdown product AKG. This latter substance is an important substrate in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. The lack of AKG shuts down the energy cycle in mitochondria, starving the cells of energy and causing apoptosis or programmed cell death. We would like to generate more interest in the investigation of cell metabolism in ALS in specific and neurodegenerative diseases in general. The fact that there is excess glutamate in ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases 
the fact that GABA, by the action of GAD, is derived from glutamate, led us to believe that there was a relative insufficiency of GABA in ALS patients. We know there is an excess of glutamate, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter, over GABA, the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Clinically, this is documented by the spasticity present in all patients. My daughter's spasticity, five plus reflexes, directed us to seek a remedy for this. We were told to use baclofen. Our research on this drug revealed that it was derived from GABA. So the question arose, why not use GABA, which is readily available and cheap? We were told that GABA does not cross the blood-brain barrier. It has been our experience that when dealing with a nervous system that has a neurodegenerative disease, the, the blood-brain barrier does not function, or at least does not function well. In fact, we put my daughter on GABA, and she told me, Dad, I can carry a glass of water across the room without spilling it. Treating my daughter with GABA was just a logical thing to do. In our opinion, it is primarily the ratio between GABA and glutamate that determines degree, the degree of muscle tone. Next, we sought out neurologists who thought out of the box, so to speak, and away from the mainstream opinion. We learned that ketones could stop nerve cell degeneration. A paper written by Dr. Veach at the National Institute of Health in 1980 established this fact. More recent papers by Dr. Veach, Dr. Zhao, and others have confirmed the fact that ketone bodies can, can supply energy to nerve cells. My daughter was placed on a ketogenic diet, medium chain, chain triglycerides, axona, which is caprylic acid, and coconut oil. We also placed her on tamoxifen. This latter drug supposedly stimulated nerve regeneration. During this period, there was also a trial with Rilotec, the only drug recommended by mainstream neurology. It increases life expectancy by two months, is extremely expensive, and has a high incidence of complications. My daughter's gastrointestinal system was having a hard time with this ketogenic diet. It dawned on us that if ketones could help, AKG is a ketone, and AKG must be lacking because it is formed from the breakdown of glutamate. AKG is readily available and very cheap. We weaned Deanna off the ketogenic diet, Exona, and the other medications. We placed her on AKG. She told us she was now able to turn over in bed in a normal way, she no longer had episodes of rigidity, and she could reflexively catch herself to stop from falling. Her muscle symptoms, spasms, fasciculations, and twitching diminished. The clincher came when we ran out of AKG and she stopped taking it. Her symptoms increased markedly, only to subside when she resumed her AKG. This latter occurrence has been repeated by other ALS patients. This is the essence of the development of the Deanna Protocol. We can treat ALS like we treat type 1 diabetes by giving the body what it cannot supply for itself. We have added to the protocol enzymes and coenzymes, which are found in the energy cycle and are felt to be important to the actions we want to enhance. Our family formed a not-for-profit foundation, winning the fight. Everyone works pro bono. Its purpose is to raise money to test the Deanna Protocol in the laboratory and fine-tune it. We have placed the cart before the horse, having testimonial evidence before documenting the benefit of the protocol with research on ALS mice. Dr. D'Agostino, who is doing the research at the University of South Florida with his colleague, Dr. Irie, will go into detail on what their research on ALS mice has documented. 
My daughter's success with the protocol gener generated interest from about 20 patients. Several of these patients went into clinical trials and did not take the Deanna protocol. Two patients who were in the last stages of the disease died. Ten patients on the Deanna protocol felt the disease process stopped or slowed down the disease progress, as evidenced by lessening of fasciculations, spasms, and tremors. One patient actually improved his ability to swallow and eat with no excess saliva and improved speech. On November 30th, 2013, the story of the Deanna Protocol was carried on the Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN News. Since then, we have had over 1,000 requests, requests and counting for the protocol from all over the world. Many have documented improvement of their symptoms. We have divided our database into rapid progressing disease, slow progressing disease, and late stage disease. The protocol is geared to cover all these categories. The disease categories, according to clinical manifestations, are as follows. One, patients with rapid progressing disease designated by frequent and persistent muscle symptoms. These patients have a remarkably positive response to the, to the protocol because their muscle symptoms diminish markedly. The patients with rapidly progressing disease need large amounts of AKG to, nerve st to stop nerve cell death. We also think they have to monitor their energy expenditure in relation to the quantity of AKG they take. Two, patients with slow progressing disease. Some do not experience much of a difference on the protocol. They are told to stop the protocol and see how they feel. These patients have few or infrequent muscle spasms, so the contrast between before and after the protocol is not that well defined. Most notice the difference after being on the protocol for several weeks and then stopping it. Three, patients in the late stage of the disease are on feeding tubes or pegs and barely mobile. These patients have very few muscle symptoms. My hypothesis is that the muscle symptoms are due to muscle and nerve cells in apoptosis program cell death, releasing abnormal action potentials that cause the muscle reactions. These patients in the later stages of the disease have fewer living cells, hence few impulses to muscles. One would think that supplying energy to their cells would not benefit them. However, it renders these patients much more comfortable and elevates their functional capacity. Since muscle cells are now known to be affected directly in ALS and not just as a result of dying nerve cells, we treat the muscles with coconut oil. Massage coconut oil contains medium chain triglycerides these are small enough to be absorbed directly through the skin and go right into the mitochondria of the muscle cells to supply energy and stop apoptosis. One of the facts that struck me in researching this disease is that I often read the diagnosis was made by, severe de by the severe degree of muscle atrophy present. This indicated that the diagnosis is made very late in the disease. Reviewing our database of over 1,000 ALS patients, we found that their history usually revealed the diagnosis was being made two years after the onset of symptoms. Many patients had back surgery for a dropped foot or other neurological findings, only to later be diagnosed with ALS. Many years ago, when I was a resident, 
rotating through pediatric orthopedics. We treated polio patients by splinting until the pain subsided and then used passive assisted range of motion exercises. This treatment resulted in paralysis. A friend of mine who had polio brought to my attention a treatment modality employed by Sister Kinney in Australia. They did not splint their polio patients, but started them immediately on hydrotherapy and active assisted range of motion exercises. Their method of treatment caused much less paralysis than our method. This fact revealed to us that there must be a retrograde stimulus, that is, a stimulus from muscle to nerve. An article in the New England Journal of Medicine recently documented that stimulating a muscle caused the secretion of acetylcholine at the myoneural junction. Deanna was started on an exercise program early in the disease, which includes cardiorespiratory exercises, progressive resistive exercises, and the oscillating plate. Her atrophy has been held in check. I believe early introduction of non-exhaustive exercise is important to retain function in the long term. One thought we would like to leave you with is that any unexplained neurological symptom should be treated prophylactically with the Deanna protocol until the diagnosis is established. If the ultimate diagnosis is a neurodegenerative disease, we will have saved cells from dying. If the condition is not a neurodegenerative disease, treatment with AKG will do no harm. Thank you for your time.